Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, Scott, I actually discovered we have something on display that I have at home. Uh, it's not a very ancient, but it is the uh, fifth generation iPod video. I thought it was pretty cool that I have one at home and we have one here. It's very nice. We have it up in our communications gallery. Te I'm technology. Te technology gallery, right? Yeah. We also have a printing press going mm -hmm. all the way back. So that's very cool. Excellent. Well, today's guest uses all types of uh, communication tools, including music and movies and more. Our guest today is Al Santos, founder and head singer of Otter Trail. Welcome, Al. Thank you for having me, man. I'm super excited. Uh, I love doing these things because uh, I get to I get to give a, a, an inside look at, at, at all the uh, doings of music and not only just my music career, but my wrestling career, you know, and, and I'm an open book, man. So ask me anything. I love to share that with the fans because they enjoy it. Fantastic. And I do want to also mention that you're the MC at this year's 2024 Northwest Tennessee Native American powwow at Discovery Park of America. And a lot of folks who came last year, it was their very first powwow and they didn't know what they were coming to and they were just blown away. So I've had I've had more people ask me this year about our upcoming powwow than any other single event that we've ever had. So a lot of good buzz, as they say. Well, that's good. You know, for me, it's 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 exciting because, to be honest with you, uh, I started being an MC several years ago, kind of on a dare. But me being a natural entertainer, you know, being in professional wrestling and 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 performing in movies and stuff, being a musician, I kind of did it. And 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 really, secretively, I I always kind of wanted to do that, you know, because I had jokes I wanted to try out that I try out of here at the house, and the kids just kind of roll their eyes, and I did it, and it was a hit. And and now, thankfully, man, I've been an MC at so many powers across the country that, uh, man, I just really love the I love to sing as well, but I just like to be on the mic and kind of let the people in on what they're watching. You know, I call it the two E, ed two E's, education and entertainment. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. Um, back us up a little bit. Uh, tell us where you came from, how you grew up, uh, what part of the country are you from? Well, I was actually born in New York City, believe it or not. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that, but I wasn't, ra I wasn't raised there, you know, but I, I was born there and my family moved around a lot. Man, I lived in about eight or nine different states and uh of course on my on my uh father's side i grew up on the island of puerto rico because i'm taino arawak but i'm also nawal on my mother's side so i got involved in powwows at a very early age i was an early teen and uh got involved in my in my culture as well and uh, realized that they went hand in hand Except when I first started, I started I started performing our traditional tribal dances and songs. But I was always attracted to the Plains style of singing and dancing, Northern and Southern Plains. Got involved in that, uh, acquired some adopted relationships throughout it, throughout the years. And here I am. And I got involved. And thankfully, I've been doing this for a very long time, 11 albums later. I've traveled the world with it. I actually actually I traveled with the performing group, the very famous uh, American Indian Dance Theater. We went all across the world. So that's kind of how I got involved in powwows and been in it ever since. And uh, me and my wife, that's basically what we do. Aside from the small, from the, from the occasional wrestling shows that we still do, I'm kind of semi-retired in that aspect. So, but yeah, that's basically what I do the most is just travel around the country and the world performing powwow music and dance. So when you were a youngster, uh, do you have memories of your very first powwows that your family took you to? Did you go with your family? Did you go alone? Was it part of your part of what y'all did all the time? Or, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I remember my mother uh, showing me pictures and I was in I, I, I'm going to say eight, nine or 10 years old. I remember her showing me pictures when she used to go to uh, 
powwows and different Native American festivals on the East Coast. Uh, and one day she shows me a picture. She's posing. And of course, this is before cell phones. So it was all Polaroids and regular. You had to you had to take the film to the to get it developed. She showed me pictures and I saw her in front of this teepee and I saw these Native American North Northern Native American dancers. And this was somewhere in Virginia. And I can't exactly remember the, the venue. But anyway, so I showed an interest immediately and I and 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 she said, well, I'll, you know, I'll take you. So she would take me to these little festivals. And again, I was so attracted to the drum, the noise that it made, the singing, the dancing. And and I knew a lot about my culture, but I didn't know anything about that culture. So that's kind of the first time that to my first exposure to it. But then I went to an actual powwow for the very first time, believe it or not, of all places in New Jersey. <laughs> it was a place called Old Bridge Powwow in Old Bridge, New Jersey. The guy who ran it was John Running Deer. He's he's long, he's been since long gone. But anyway, that's kind of that's kind of when I got bit by the bug. And like they say, man, the rest is history. So uh, as I was telling Zach earlier before we got on here with you, that I'm right in the middle of doing a lot of research about Tennessee um in uh early 1800s and the different tribes and you know all the negotiations over the land and you know can you uh when it comes to a powwow and you're reflecting back on the culture of the various tribes and the various areas of the country do you settle upon a particular era or is it just a, a mix mash of all the different eras? Talk to us a little bit about where the where wh what we're actually celebrating there when we're at a powwow. You know, that's a good good question because believe it or not, when I when I, I am MC, depending on where I am in the United States, what region, what area, I try to read up on the local history uh, of the particular tribes in that area. So uh, and I do that because when the public comes to see a powwow, they don't just want to see the contest dancing. They want to be informed. They want to know where the jingle dress comes from. They want to know where men's traditional or grass comes from. So I, I really do my best to try to educate them and at the same time entertain them by keeping it lively and funny. For example, uh, you know, when you talk about Tennessee, for example, you know, uh, people need to know that there were tribes there in Tennessee. Um, now, Tennessee doesn't have any federally recognized tribes, but the, but they historically there were there were Choctaws there. There were Chick Cherokees there, you know, uh, ancient mound builders there. And there's still a community of Choctaws from the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians that have a community there in Tennessee. And uh, people need to know that, you know, they need to know about that. So uh, because they have a lot of questions, either because they're curious and they love our Native American culture or they might be trying to reconnect with their heritage. You know what I mean? So I always try to make it a point when I was in Fort Washakie a few weeks ago that, of course, that was the um, Shoshone tribe. I tried to you know, let them know about the connection between the Shoshones and the Aztecs, for example, you know, the the Shoshones and the Utes and the uh, uh, Hopis and a lot of the tribes, Comanches out that way, they speak a language called Udo Aztec, and which is directly related to the Aztec language of the Aztec people of Mexico. And they acknowledge it. So they like to hear it. Uh, uh, about things like that. So that's a good question. Yes, I focus more on the history if there's individuals there that know more about it than I do, I, I, I absolutely 100% uh, you know, introduce them, especially if they're educators and things of that nature. But, but yeah, that's a good question because a lot of MCs don't do that, man. They just kind of, they're there for the paycheck and I try to educate them, entertain them, you know, and keep it lively. But above all, if they have questions, I, I encourage them to ask those questions. Well, um, I've been as part of this research I've been doing, I've been trying to find firsthand where people wrote what they observed of the Native Americans that they ran across along the Mississippi River, along the Tennessee um, portion of the Mississippi River. And it's really uh fascinating to me having been to my very first powwow here at Discovery Park last year and to read what these people observed when they you know, went to shore and came upon a uh, Native American in their dress and clothes and, you know, um, how regal a lot of the descriptions are. And and that's really what I experienced here. Um, there's a lot of people listening who have never been to a powwow before right now. Can you describe what the experience is like 
for a first time visitor to a powwow? Well, I think the the biggest misconception, and I get this all the time, is oh well, are we allowed to participate? Are we allowed to come and take pictures? Are we allowed to even be there? You know, a powwow is basically a modern celebration of songs and dance. Of course, Native American song and dance. Absolutely, you're more than welcome to come. Uh, some powwows are a little more traditional than others. So, in other words, they're more ceremonial in 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 uh, in uh, in the fact that they participate more with their traditional doings, and they don't. They still welcome the outside world, but they don't have admission, for example. They don't have vendors. And then there's powwows that are more social, like the one that we have there in Discovery Park. So, yes, you can absolutely come and take pictures and even participate. That's another thing that as, a, as an MC, I like to do. I like to do audience participation. There's songs and dances where the general public is absolutely encouraged and invited to partake of. And it makes it fun. It makes it lively because people have a misconception that Native Americans are stoic people that don't smile and don't have a sense of humor. Well, that's furthest from the truth. So you come to a powwow to celebrate the songs, the dance, the food, the culture as a whole, Native American culture. But, um, you know, more than that, we want you to leave with a good experience and come back the following year. So when you come there, a powwow is just a social gathering. There are powwows that are contest powwows where you're, you're going to see dancers competing for prize money, which are the more popular powwows nowadays, the ones that attract more people. And then you have your social powwows, which are good, but they're a little bit smaller and a little bit more reserved as far as what they share with the general public. So that's basically what a powwow is. It's just an intertribal celebration of Native American culture. Now, let's... um. In a, in a, just a minute, I want to talk to you about the uh, Disney Marvel TV series Echo oh, that yes. you, you were part of, and also uh, the most recent movie with Lily Gladstone, who I really love, um, Fancy Dance. It's on Apple TV. But first, I'm going to let Zach ask you a little bit about wrestling, because that's his purview. <clears throat> I, I am a big wrestling fan. And when we spoke on the phone, you spelled out K-Y-O-T-E when giving me your email. I, I was wondering what that meant and then discovered it stood for uh, Coyote. That was part of your wrestling name before. I think you now go by Al Farad. Uh, could you just tell us more about the wrestling world and how long you've been doing that? Man, you did your homework. Uh, <laughs> well, so here's a, here's a quick story because it's a long story, but I do have a condensed version. I never knew that my, my, uh, my mother's cousin was involved in wrestling. Now I got bit by the bug, the wrestling bug in 1973 when I was a little bitty kid. And, uh, I used to watch it on TV. My grandpa would always come over, my father's father, and we'd watch live wrestling from the Philadelphia Spectrum on Prism TV. And I would always watch these bad guys and good guys. And for some reason, I was always attracted to the real monster bad guys, the guys that had foreign objects and wore curly toe boots. And they were from Russia. And majority of these guys weren't even from these places. This is just a character. It's just a movie. You're watching a movie pretty much. So anyway, fast forward, I find out my my mother's cousin was not only a world famous wrestler, but he had a school on Front Street, on Gleason's Gym on Front Street in Brooklyn, New York. So I enroll in the school and I uh, start, you know, practicing. And at the and, and at the uh, age of 17, I get I mean, this was I was 15 when I started training at 17. I lie about my age and get had my first match against the world famous Nikolai Volkov. And um, anyway, so. Fast forward, I, I had several characters. Back then, I they I used to wrestle as Pedro Santos. Then I switched to uh, uh, Dancing Wolf. Then I was Coyote Santos. And then uh, Al Farad came, uh, came out. And the reason why that happened was one of my mentors at the time was the world-famous uh, General Skandar Akbar, who was a very famous Arab wrestler. Who, Matter of fact, he really is Lebanese. He's of Lebanese descent. But anyway, so I had this thing going on, my little goatee. And he said, you ever thought about being a an Arab heel? Keep in mind, this is during 9-11. I, I was I, that's how recent I started doing it. I said, no, not really. He said, well, you do the Native American thing. You ought to try being a, an Arab heel because nobody's doing it right now. Well, nobody wanted to because of 9-11. So I did. <laughs> and it was a hit. But I've wrestled everybody from, I kid you not, from Ric Flair to Abdullah the Butcher, the great Muda. I've wrestled every big name. I was even there 
I was there the night that Bruiser Brody was murdered in Puerto Rico. If anybody knows anything about wrestling that was a really big deal but you name them and i've been in the ring with them and now i have future generations like my nephew dk who's in the business my nephew aj farat who's in the business and the reason why i chose the name farat was because growing up remember i told you i was really into the heel wrestlers the bad guys well my absolute favorite at the time was a guy named the original sheik not the Iron Sheik, the original Sheik. Well, his name was Eddie Farhat. That's his actual real name. So when I started in the business, his son, Eddie Farhat Jr., and me were very close. To this day, he well, he's gone now, but till uh, up till before he passed, he always called me cuz. And he'd say, yeah, keep keep our memory going. And long story short, I, I, I used Farhat first, Al Farhat. But then his his brother, which was the Sheik's or uh, the original Sheik's legitimate nephew, his name is Sabu, real, real famous guy from ECW. He was not not happy with, even though he wasn't using the last name. He's legitimately his nephew, and he made a big stink about it. So I took the H off. So I just became Farat. But yeah, man, I've been doing it since. Uh, well, do the math since eighty seven. I'm inducted in three halls of fame. <laughs> That's what Kimberly yeah. told us. I was going to ask you what those were. Yeah, yeah. I'm inducted into the Southern States Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. I'm inducted into the um, NWA Texas Hall of Fame and the Buzzsaw Hall of Fame. So I'm pretty lucky. Now, I never made it to WWE, never made it to the big leagues because of my music. I was always involved in my power mm -hmm. music, but I always kind of did wrestling as a hobby. And uh, now when I go to these shows, man, they they on the poster, they'll put, you know, legend the legend the 35 36 37 year legend now Farat, blah 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 and now they which is funny because i always try to keep scott this is weird this is this is just something i tell everybody i always try to keep my wrestling and power career separate because to me they don't go hand in hand and inadvertently without you know wanting to because of echo because of you know other projects i'm doing now when they promote me on a wrestling poster <laughs> they put as featured on Marvel, Echo, <laughs> whatever. You know what I mean? So it's real funny that it worked out that way. Well, around here, we have a real uh, appreciation for wrestling. You know, I'm from Memphis, and so the Mid-South Coliseum and uh, Jerry Lawler, you know, back in the, the 70s when I was growing up, you know, I was huge. That was oh. one of my favorite That was one of my favorite territories. I, I, we didn't catch it up north a lot, but later on, you know, with the advent of the internet and stuff like that, man, I I had I gotta say Memphis wrestling, we beyond a shadow of a doubt, was one of the best in the country because it was hard hitting, it was smash mouth, it was it was so way ahead of its time. And then imagine this, Scott. Imagine getting to a wrestling match, I mean to a to a venue for a wrestling match, and the promoter telling you, Oh, your opponent tonight is Jerry the King Lawler. <laughs> dude i got to wrestle him like three times dude oh, wow. And it was, wow yeah it's it's on the internet look it up Ch check out uh, uh, alpha rot versus jerry lawler there's like awesome. two or three matches on there so i know what you mean man i love 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 memphis wrestling I'll, so, go ahead sorry. I, I saw recently like even recent wwe talent you've worked with like jacob fatu he's in one of the biggest storylines possibly ever with the bloodline so that that's cool you still work with those folks well, and, and what happened is, and again, I, I, I don't brag about myself because sometimes I, I don't realize my wife tells me, you know, you, you just don't realize how much people know you. You know, I, it, like sometimes let me give you an example. I was at the Mohegan Powell this past weekend in, in uh, uh, Uncasville, Connecticut, the Mohegan Sun. And there was a Comic-Con going on. A, 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 it was called Terrificon by Comic-Con. Anyway, so of course, there was, we're walking through the hallway and there's hundreds of people with Marvel shirts on and whatever. And all of a sudden, I hear somebody yelling. And I, I look back and this young lady said, hey, weren't you in a, weren't you an Echo? You and you? Because my wife was with me and we were in full gear. Mm -hmm. So of course, they're going to recognize me because you can see my face. And I had my cowboy hat and I said, well, I sure was. Within minutes, I had hundreds of people around me asking for my autograph. And then one of those guys says, man, I know you from somewhere else. I watched you and I don't know where. And I said, the Arab legend, Al Farad, you would have thought this guy <laughs> met Jesus. <laughs> and and so, so yeah, um, uh, what happened is I, now they use me here recently before he went into the WWE. 
they called me and said, hey, uh, there's two guys that I want you to manage. Well, first, they wanted me to manage my nephew against Jacob Fatu. There's a picture online somewhere of me standing behind mm-hmm. my nephew pointing at Jacob Fatu. Well, later on, they put us in a faction. And I managed Jacob Fatu and his cousin Zilla Fatu, which is Umaga's son. There's pictures and videos of that as well. Wow. And then he makes it to the big league. I literally, I recently got a, a, a phone call, as a matter of fact, from them saying, thanking me for all the stuff I had done. And like I said, you, I just don't realize, you know, the scope sometimes of some of the things that I do. But I'm very thankful to God because, man, I have such a wonderful life. So you mentioned your wife. Did you guys meet at a powwow? And you said she participated. Does she also uh, play the drums or dance or what is her role? Well, um, my current wife, I've known her for about 20 years. I met her in uh, Toyot, Colorado, years and years ago, about 20 years ago. And I knew her father, but we were both in relationships. Uh, So then, of course, you know, her and her ex uh, broke up and my and my ex broke up and she had kids and I had kids and and uh, about five, four or five years ago, we reconnected and realized that we had no one. And uh, so we started kind of talking and one thing led to the other. And now she's such an integral part of our group. She's like she's like my manager, my right hand person. And and she sings. She dances. She doesn't drum because women don't actually drum. It's okay. a cultural thing. Yeah. But yeah. She is like, uh, and then, and, and we're both in Echo. We're both in Fancy Dance. And check this out. This is not for you, Scott. This is for my wrestling buddy. <laughs> my wife is Sahara. She's the one that manages me in a burka. And, uh, and you know, and I, and, 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 I, and I say this kind of like tongue in, tongue in cheek because I don't want, you know, with this cancel culture now, you got to be real careful. So I make it a point to tell people if there are any people of Middle Eastern descent out there, I make it a point to tell them this is just a movie. That's all it is. It's not real. It's a show. Do people get hurt? Of course. But for the most part, that's what it is. It's a big soap opera. So we are just actors. When people say, well, you shouldn't be doing an Arabic uh, character because you're not Arabic. Well, first of all, on my Puerto Rican side, there is a lot of Arabic, Arabic influence in our culture. That's why we pronounce the R instead of like every other Latin American country. So there is there is a lot of uh, uh, Arabic influence in our culture. But that's besides the point. I always tell people Godzilla doesn't exist. There really is no Superman. You know, we're just actors. So, you know, fans need to look at wrestling like a movie, like just like you would go and, and watch a movie. And then you have the other ones that say, well, it's fake. No. Sherlock of course it is you know <laughs> it's just it's it's again it's just a movie you're watching a movie so you know but what but but I'm, I'm at a point right now actually where I'm I'm at the tail end of my career because I've been doing this for a long time I want to say over 35 years so now I've pr- pretty much mainly just manage guys train young guys I've trained like 22 uh individuals for the business young guys that have now made a name for themselves in the wrestling business so we're going to take a quick break and when we get back we're going to um, ask you more about these movies that you've been working with with nine branches in west tennessee and nationwide atm and branch access you can take leaders credit union with you wherever you go from checking accounts credit cards home loans and their state-of-the-art mobile app banking with leaders can help you move forward learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Al Santos, founder and head singer of Otter Trail and our MC for Discovery Park's upcoming powwow. Uh, when we left, we were getting ready to talk about the movies that you've been uh, involved in, some really uh, impressive ones. I have not yet seen um, the um, fan, the uh, what's it called? Fancy Dance is that the one that's yeah. on Apple? I've got it on my list of of ones to watch um, because I love the actress uh, that's in there. And then, uh, of course, you're in the Marvel one. Tell us how that all came about. Well, you know, uh, me, I, me having always been involved in some aspect of entertainment, whether it was wrestling or music, uh, I always kept an eye open for that. You know, my my ear to the ground. So I always wanted I always wanted to be in some sort of 
<laughs> TV thing or movie. So years ago, uh, after my, I think it was my third or fourth album got nominated for the, for the Grammys for, uh, best traditional album of the year. We've been, we've been nominated twice when the Grammys had a were a, a native American division. Now they lumped it into the world division, mm. world music or, or, or what they call new age and stuff. But anyway, so the second time we got nominated, I actually got a phone call about 11 o'clock at night. And I thought it was a prank call. This is again, before cell phones. So I get a phone call and they said, Hey, do you know a Sonny Moreno? I said, yeah, from the group, you a very good friend of mine. She's a neighbor. She was like four, four block. I mean, uh, four houses down. Well, she recommended you for a project that we're doing, but here's the thing. We need to pick you up within the hour. I'm like, what in the world? So they, they sent a limo to my house about midnight, me and my little brother, Steven Perez, he went with me. Cause I was like, man, what if they, what if they killed, they, they, <laughs> kill me somewhere or hold me up for ransom <laughs> so he he uh he went with me we get to this building go all the way to the top top floor and there was a studio there called noise productions i can't and i forget the guy's name but anyway i walk in there and they give me a little part that they wanted me to do kind of like in some native american chanting and i did it on one take they said thank you very much it gave me a check for a thousand dollars a box of cuban cigars because they knew i'm a, i'm an avid cigar smoker still am they give me cigars and then i i um i was on my merry way come to find out i was i was i did a a gutter what's called a guttural voiceover for a the major motion picture soundtrack of mission impossible with tom cruise the first one you know that song they go dun, 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 that one well i did some chanting for that and when you hear the chanting it's in there and and i got I was in the credits. Of course, I didn't get I didn't get paid a whole lot of money for it. Had I known then what I know now. <laughs> but anyway, so that was my first experience. And then years later, a buddy of mine calls me and said, hey, they're, they're producing a movie, an MMA movie about uh, a MMA fighter called Gil Gracie, I guess from the Gracie family. And um, they want you to be in it because he said because he because he, he did crossover. He did some wrestling matches. And I guess he told a producer, my best wrestling match was with a guy named Al Farad. Of course, back then I wrestled as Coyote, Coyote Santos. They featured my match in the movie and it was an HBO movie. It's You can still find it on Netflix and YouTube and stuff. So that was my second one. So then I did a few commercials and stuff like that. And I decided to get an agent. I did the headshots and but never got anything for years and years and years till one day I get a phone call right when I'm living in this house because I bought this house about four years ago. By the way, I, I live in Apache, Oklahoma on mm. four acres, beautiful house Four got four bedrooms. Boy, I got, I really, 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 uh, after my, after my divorce, I, I kind of didn't think I'd ever recover, but not boy, boy, how did I re recover? Anyway, so back to my story. So I'm sitting here and I remember being real sad that day for whatever reason, because I had just bought the house and I'm like, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to do this? You know how that goes. <clears throat> I had a lot of bills and I had already me and me and my current wife were already together, but we were struggling, you know, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. True story, Scott. I get a phone call from a lady named Ma Mary Margaret. She goes, is this Al Santos? I said, this sure is. And I had already been inducted into the halls of fame, and said, so and what it, and I figured it out. It's because I'm 55 years old. Well, I was already in my 50s, so I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm at the tail end. Nothing else is going to happen. I never, never made it to where I wanted to make it. And I get that phone call, and she said, "You are. Uh, I need you to. Uh, I need to know what your availability is because we want to use your drum group for our upcoming Marvel Disney." TV series called Echo about a Native American uh, fe uh, female superhero who's deaf. I hung up on her, Scott. <laughs> I kid you not. I thought it was a joke. She calls back and she tells me, no, your niece, Pishon Bread. When she said Pishon Bread, who's my niece, now I said, oh, wait a minute. This, this must be real. Long story short, they flew us to Atlanta, Georgia. We were out there for three weeks. Came back home, went back about uh, two weeks later for the final scene. And there we were. And they asked me while I was there, they asked me, they said, um, can we use your T-shirts? 
can some of the actors use your t-shirts for behind, you know, so what they call a background actors. And we want to feature your music. We want you to, we want you to compose original music because we can't use other people. In the, sure. And I, and I compose native American music. So anyway, we get there and we're doing all that. I had already, I had my music, I had everything down and, and, and of course we're just getting paid peanuts, by the way, $350 a week. I think it was $25 a day stipend. And then they paid us $700 for travel. So we had to pay our own travel there and back. So I'm, I did the math. I, we were losing money, $350 a week. You know, I was, anyway, we, we both quit our jobs. That's how, that's how wow. much we wanted to do it. Yeah. yeah. That's how bad we wanted to do it. So we go there. Second day we're shooting, Scott. We're singing like this, doing, and they kept saying, of course, cut, you know, over. I see a, uh, the, the director runs across the, I guess she, he was talking to somebody. The director runs across the set, said, stop, 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 stop. This lady uh, from, from she mentioned the organization, but I didn't know what it was. She wants to talk to the drum group. And she goes right in front of everybody, right there on set. She goes, these guys are singing. They're using their voices. They're no longer background actors. If you use your voice, that's a speaking part. You, we need to put these guys on SAG contracts, and they put us on Screen Actors Guild. We went from making three hundred fifty dollars plus a week plus twenty five dollars a day to making thirty five hundred dollars a week, a hundred dollars a day for stipend, and they paid for all expenses. I was shocked. And we have to be on the credits and receive royalties for the rest of our lives. Oh man, yeah, I'm that's great. I've gotten two checks from them already. But anyway, so we did that and we were featured prominently there, especially on that episode five where you see the powwow scene. I can't begin to tell you how many doors have opened since then for MC, for host drum. Well, then we finish, we wrap up and not even a month later, I get a phone call from Holly Sue Gray, my sister, and she tells me, hey, the one of the directors of Reservation Dogs, the famous Reservation Dogs on Hulu, uh, she wants to use you guys for an upcoming movie called Fancy Dance about mis murdered and missing indigenous women. And and get this, it features Lily Gladstone, the same lady from Killers of the Flower Moon. I said, you're kidding. So we we did that. We filmed that. Uh, that was that was right here in Oklahoma City. And it went it went straight to theaters. It went to the Sundance Film Festival first. Then it got picked up by Apple Apple Films. And it was in theaters till right up till recently. Now it's on Apple TV. So Scott, to say I'm blessed is an understatement. I yeah, thank Creator incredible. for everything. It's amazing. I mean, part part of that story starts off where you stepped out in faith without really, you know, you quit your job to go do this thing that you something told you this was the thing to do. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And now I pretty much live off of my my art, my talent. And, you know, I, I was never really a big believer uh, or a prayerful man, but a lot of things have changed in my life, you know, and, and now uh, I don't know how I don't know how god fearing a christian you guys are but i i i honestly believe that all of it was because of my belief in my lord and savior i, I really believe that you know yeah. and, and 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 of course you know a lot of native americans they you know they're more traditional in their beliefs you know in their spirituality i i tend to meld them both together because i believe there's only one creator and i really believe that he changed my life for the better and now so many things are happening which brings us to, of course, Discovery Park of America Powwow, our second annual coming. And I can't wait to visit with people there. And I know that once this gets out, people are going to, you know, want to meet us. And, and we're, we're going to have 8 by 10s being my wife, you know, Echo 8 by 10s will be happy to answer any questions and take all the pictures that they want. Yeah, I know. I know everybody's looking forward to that. And especially after they hear this and learn a little bit more, I think they're really going to be um, excited. And we're excited to uh, for you to get to be back here and experience a little bit more Northwest Tennessee hospitality. Oh, man, I can't wait. Let me tell you, the first year we went there, of course, you know, it was our first time. So, of course, there are going to be bumps in the road and stuff. But this second year is going to be better in the third and the fourth and the fifth. And I can't wait to see how far this relationship goes between my little family and Discovery Park 
But one thing's for sure, I'm certainly very, very proud and honored to be a part of it. And I thank you guys for bringing such a an awesome event because there are other Native American powwows in the state of Tennessee. But I truly believe that at the rate this one's going, it's going to be the premier one. Hey, and that's exactly what we're shooting for. Thank you so much for joining us here on our podcast. And we can't wait to see you here in Northwest Tennessee. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys soon. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, come see us on our second annual Discovery Park of America powwow. Come sing, come dance, come eat Native American food, and above all, enjoy yourselves to the max. You're going to love it. And thank you to all of you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.